Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we'll be highlighting the work of two museums deeply focused on the lives of enslaved people. Our special guests today are Ashley Rogers, Executive Director of the Whitney Plantation Museum in Louisiana, and Woody Keown, Jr., President and COO of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. So thank you both for joining us. It's just wonderful to have you. And I'm going to uh, set you up uh, simply by stating the obvious that racism has been a factor in our world forever. And in America, it has taken different forms for native black, Latin, Hispanic, Asian, and other peoples. So today we'll focus on the kidnapping and enslavement of Africans, the long march to freedom and equality for black Americans, and how the resonance of our history affects us today. So. Ashley, let's let's begin with you. We're going to um, to uh, talk about your institutions and this story through the eyes of, of your institutions. So tell us about the Whitney Plantation Museum, its origins and your mission. Thank you so much for having me. The Whitney Plantation um, is a museum and memorial dedicated to the history of enslavement in South Louisiana. Uh, we're located about one hour between Baton Rouge and New Orleans in what was once one of the densest plantation districts in the country. Um, historically, Whitney Plantation was a sugarcane, indigo, and rice plantation established in 1752 and in operation until 1975. Um, it was uh, purchased by a uh, chemical company, Formosa Plastics and Fibers Corporation from Taiwan who intended on building the world's largest rayon manufacturing site um, at Whitney Plantation. Um, when the community resisted that, uh, the deal did not go through and they sold the campus of the plantation to John Cummings, our founder, who's a wealthy lawyer from New Orleans, who spent 15 years restoring it and opening it to the public in 2014. So we're now in our seventh year um, it is a unique site, a uh, plantation museum in an area with a lot of um, plantation tourism um, that's been, you know, marketed to the public in terms of the opulence of the plantation owners. Um, and the weddings and the events and so on and so forth, basically glossing over the, the fact that these were slave labor, ca labor camps yes. um, to extract wealth from the, from the lives and the lifeblood of, of individuals. And, and you've turned that story on its head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Whitney Plantation, you know, our mission is uh, that we educate the public about the history and legacies of slavery. Um, legacies being very important because our story doesn't stop in 1865. There's a long continuation of these kinds of practices after the end of slavery. Um, and, you know, it's in addition to being, you know, a site where you can see things like the big house and slave cabins and all of the, you know, external structures. It's also a memorial where we've built memorials that name and honor people who were held in slavery in the state of Louisiana. So it's just a fundamentally different experience. The thing that strikes me is that if you take a look at, at, at the unfolding of this history, it starts with people being kidnapped from their daily lives. They're just like you and me, right? We're going about our daily lives and all of a sudden, armed people come in, uh, round us up, and start the transportation and the conversion into chains. And then you go, if you survive the journey, you, you uh, go and you live completely sundered from your history, uh, sundered from, your, from those that you know, and then trying to form new relations and, and building a culture. And then uh, what do you celebrate the exact reverse journey, don't you? Yes, we do. Um, we are basically uh, picks up the story in terms of uh, talking about the, uh, it's really a part of American history, Mark, uh, but uh, we, we talk about it from the uh, lens of an African ancestry perspective, from the time that, uh, you know, Africans were uh, enslaved over in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Africa, uh, brought to this country uh, in terrible conditions and were enslaved here, families were uh, broken up, uh, and uh, people were used to, to provide free labor for a lot of folks became very, very wealthy and left a lot of folks behind in the process. 
And this was a this was actually a business model, right? And and there were a lot of components to it, right? You had uh, people of different um, ethnicities on the ground targeting um, population groups, attacking them. Uh, then there was this whole supply chain of, and and all these these processes of of first attacking, uh, separating, figuring out who was going to be the highest value product, then productizing them transporting there was a whole logistics component right there were there were uh, uh, merchants American merchants and British merchants whose uh, trade their stock and trade was simply transporting product and keeping that product alive or sufficient numbers so that they can make a make a, a profit you know the, the issue of, of, of how we think about, our own business activities on a global basis really do, does come to the fore, doesn't it? Oh, with this, uh, you know, when you go back and look at the uh, the history of, of, of slavery and enslavement in, in the U.S., I mean, it really started many, many years ago in Europe and expanded to, to the U United States and the United States uh, uh, and, and also South America as well. Uh, right. But basically, it provided the basis of a lot of American uh, business capital business models right now. And the essence of it was that... Uh, you know, a lot of people were getting free labor. And, um, you know, we have some information that talks about uh, how a lot of the business models in terms of inventory, you know, profit of, 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 of property, uh, how people were, uh, you know, plan the market in terms of, you know, uh, supply demand the market in terms of uh, people as, as chattel property and, and how they were using that basically to uh, maximize profits for themselves but uh, not, uh, not including the, the people who were involved at all. So it, it, it really provides a major business uh, foundation model that a lot of businesses use today when you go back to the origin of what happened as far as slavery is concerned and the economics of slavery, which is really what this was really principle on. Uh, economics, uh, economic empowerment of a few people at the expense of a lot of other folks. We're going to come back to how do you heal that aspect of, of how business functions? How do you heal that aspect of how uh, society functions? But I'd like to get back a, a little bit to this idea of, of how culture is built and how um, uh, the, the transition to freedom occurred, because there is also uh, a myth that somehow um, people who were enslaved were freed by, by people who are um, white who became disaffected with the idea of slavery, but that's actually not the case. Culture was actually created from within the um, African and then African American community and promulgated and these ideas of freedom and these actions that resulted in freedom uh, really come from within the heart of that community. Ashley, could you talk about the experience of the Whitney uh, uh, plantation and how this, this hope and these ideas of freedom were kept alive and how culture was developed under the most adverse of circumstances. Certainly, well, you know, I think that um, it just, it, thinking about the, the moment of freedom in 1865, right? Um, it's not really one moment, it's many moments over a few years, right? And um, this is a really, this is a moment where you can understand what's happening to me to understand freedom you have to also understand power and you're um, referring to juneteenth so this was when the when the last of of those who were enslaved received word that they were no longer enslaved right after that the, is the moment you're talking about after and that's, the, that's the federal holiday that was just voted on by congress and approved as a national holiday so the 13th amendment was passed in 1865, which is the legal end to slavery. Um, Juneteenth is really a regional holiday um, specific to Texas and to these people. Um, but you know, throughout the South during the Civil War, as the Union Army was coming through, there were contestations of power. And Louisiana is really central to that story because the Union captured New Orleans early on 1862. And as soon as the Union Army is there, it is a fissure in this slaveholding block, you know? So enslaved people suddenly have their numbers to their advantage for the first time. They start walking off of plantations, they join up with the Union Army. We know this happened at Whitney Plantation. I know of at least one, and we're looking for more, men who were enslaved on the plantation who fought with the Union Army for three years. Louisiana contributed more US colored troops than any other state. 
because there were so many people enslaved there and they were interested in and you know did participate in their own freedom making um, during the civil war over 500,000 people left plantations i mean it was this mass exodus of people um, who were using this power dynamic change to grab something in a, in a huge way for the first time. So those policies that come from above are really a reaction to what's happening on the ground. You know, in Louisiana, slavery had become untenable before 1865. Slavery ends in Louisiana in 1864 because people will not be enslaved anymore. And that's really, it's important to look at those moments where there can be a breakthrough because you understand what's been happening for a very long time. People have been waiting for this moment, you know, to capture. There, there are techniques to keep people enslaved, right? Techniques of sundering education, mm -hmm. sund sundering uh, communication, sundering families. Woody, could you talk uh, about how the Underground Railroad uh, grew up? Because in many respects, if you take a look at what's what's happening now, uh, for example, with voter suppression and this idea of 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 not providing information, the uh, you know I'm referring here to the 1619 um, uh, project and the um, the educator who is not being granted tenure at least for now at the University of North Carolina, uh, some of the other issues uh, uh, surrounding the laws that have been passed on. Uh, barring um, the teaching of, of uh, ideas around race uh, encapsulated by uh, critical race theory and those kinds of things. How did the, did the National Underground Railroad, how does, it, how does it unfold the coming together and the countering of those types of strategies in order to create cohesion and then a network that, that uh, transports people out of slavery? Oh, thanks, Mark. I mean, I think it kind of goes back to what Ashley was mentioning in terms of and the question you asked around culture. Um, the the enslaved uh, African uh, African Americans basically never never really accepted, uh, you know, their uh, at least for the most part their this this situation they were put in, and so the situation in terms of uh, uh, this this idea that I don't have any freedom of family. You know, when they came into the country, they were split up. Uh, and you know, families were broken up. Uh, uh, living conditions were horrible, uh, and and people just had that innate ability and desire to be free. And as a result, a lot, a lot of people people risked their lives to basically try to get to whatever freedom, wherever that freedom was. And generally, it, it was to the north. And so, a lot of uh, slaves took chances, uh, you know, and basically tried to escape. Uh, many were killed in that process but that did not kill the spirit of a warning and a desire for freedom. And so what happened was the Underground Railroad basically became a network of, of allies. It was really the nation's first social justice movement. And it was a multicultural, multiracial because some people uh, knew slavery was wrong, but it was the law of the land. And after a while, you know, some of these folks who uh, decided that they could no longer sit on the sideline, decided we're going to get involved and try to do some things to to uh, to help people to achieve this freedom that we're talking about because it's so wrong. And so this whole thing around uh, people coming together in this resistance movement, even though it was slavery was the law of the land, people knew it was wrong morally and people sought to, to do something about it, a few people. And over time, uh, it's been a long, long process. We've had several different movements in this process of freedom has taken quite a, quite a turn. And so the, the, the 1619 project, I think is a great project that basically has kind of tied this together from the historical standpoint, when this slave ship first landed in America in 1619 and how this whole process unfolded and what it has done. And again, it comes back to the economics of the uh, country and how it made people uh, very, very wealthy. Uh, but it came out of resistance movement from a lot of people in a lot of different ways, but primarily driven by the Africans who were enslaved and their pursuit and desire to be free and to do almost whatever it takes to, to make that happen. Woody, could you educate us on the earliest origins of the Underground uh, 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 Railroad? Um, where, where was the inception? What, what date? Did, did you fir could you first identify a freedom process that, that connected to what was later called the Underground Railroad? 
I can't remember the exact date, Mark, uh, but I can tell you that, that it uh, the Underground Railroad started taking shape really, you know, decades before we typically talk about it in terms of the 1800s. That's when a lot of people hear when the slave ships arrived. But the Underground Railroad, uh, the network and the concept itself started, uh, you know, decades before because it was uh, it was kind of like the way uh, the European economy was built. And so a lot of people there was there was uh, discussions about people who knew that it was wrong and they outlawed it in Europe, but they continued to, in some pockets in Europe to continue to do it because of the economic benefit to the to very uh, a lot of people, and then it came here to the U.S. So I would say it it, it uh, was it originated decades uh, before it actually came here to the U.S. Uh, before the 1800s here in the U.S. Uh, so uh, I would say around the late 1700s uh, time frame. Uh, is when it really became uh, uh, more prominently known uh, to people and what was going on. It was predominantly a political fight at that time, uh, you know, and uh, then when they started changing and outlawed it in Europe, uh, the United States decided to continue. It was uh, just at the beginning stages of making a lot of money for a lot of people here in the U.S. And if you, if you trace back the Underground rail, uh, Railroad, right? You have, it, it basically seems to uh, go along a thread of trade mm -hmm. as well as ideas, right? And then if you bring it up to, to a more contemporary time, right, there was the film, The Green Book, which, which uh, highlighted the, the travels of, of two people of different races, right? Um, an artist and, and his bodyguard. Um, ac across the South, that actually traces some of those same roots. So these these ideas really do have resonance. They're they're shaped laboriously by people who are enslaved, working under the most adverse of conditions, and allies. And and um, over time, you're you're creating this this um, this conduit for change that can then expand beyond that route. In terms of of this. Uh, connection to today's um, events. Um, how do you see, uh, Ashley, the uh, experience of a uh, plantation that is telling a different story than this illusion of grandeur and grace that has been promulgated? How do you see that, that story connecting to today's issues with uh, white supremacy, with uh, the dialogue that we're that we're seeing around uh, racial tensions, um, what do, would you hope that people experiencing um, your facility come away with that informs their thinking and their actions today? Well, we're just beginning to really think about that in a more formal way, and whether we give people maybe resources on their way out the door to think about. Um, the way that I've always conceived of this is that I want people to leave the site and understand their world differently, um, to be able to read the news and understand things in more context, because I think that people are definitely coming to us for answers. We know that because we see spikes in interest whenever there are major protests around Black Lives Matter, and that's been going on since the very beginning. I mean, Whitney Plantation opened to the public just a few months after Michael Brown was murdered. And so that's always been top of mind for our visitors. We have visitor reflection wall that reflects that in, in moments of national you know, strife when people are casting around and trying to figure out their world and how this connects to the past, they come to us. Who so, visits? What, what are the demographics? Is there, is there a white, black, Asian uh, tourist versus resident? How do you... So what, of the audience. Most of the people who come to us are tourists or travelers to New Orleans. And that's just because of the, so we're in the middle of, it's still uh, sugarcane fields all around us. Our community that we are in, situated in is only a thousand people. Um, it's a very rural area. And the city of New Orleans has about 400,000 residents, but in 2019 got 20 million visitors. So necessarily by the numbers, we're gonna get more tourists than we are locals, just because there's not that many people here. Um, so we have about 85% of our visitors are coming from out of town. Many of the people who come to us are coming on kind of a pilgrimage journey that they've come specifically you know, to see Whitney. They're not interested in the other plantations. Sometimes they're coming to Louisiana just to see us. Um, in terms of 
race and age, our visitors are different from, you know, a more a traditional museum um, that tends to get older white visitors. But that's not really our audience. Our largest share are young adults. Um, and we have about 40% African American visitors. White people are actually not the majority, about 49%. Um, so it's very, it's a, it's a big mix. We also get a lot of people international as well. So that's, that's kind of come down because of COVID and restrictions on travel. But previously about 20% of our visitors didn't live in the United States. So we have a lot of people who are coming from really all over the world, Europe, the Caribbean, Africa, um, and coming to learn about our story. It's really interesting. We just took two polls. One was the question about uh, whether Juneteenth, whether people supported uh, Juneteenth as a national holiday and the vast majority um, agreed with that. The second poll, which is uh, still underway, was when the last time uh, people went to a museum or saw a museum exhibition that specifically focused on the legacy of slavery in this country. And um, we, we gave a number of different, uh, different options, never actually received 20%, never having, having uh, uh, viewed such a uh, exhibition is a, is, is a big response. And I think that's, that points to the failure of, of the discussion. And 20% said that they can't remember. So it's, it's it's um, it's a it's a big proportion of people who have never actually uh, discussed the issue. Uh, Woody, could you talk a little bit about how you present the um, the knowledge and the history that is represented by uh, by your staff and and your organization to others who are visiting? And tell us a little bit about the configuration of the audience. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what, what we do is we have a variety of ways that we present our story. Uh, uh, the main uh, and more traditional route is to help people come to the facility on site visits. And we provide, uh, uh, we're not doing as much right now, but uh, before COVID, we were doing guided tours. We have dozens who do that. Uh, but uh, as we got into COVID, uh, we wanted to stay in touch with our audience. So what we uh, did is that we have always been working in the virtual world. But we ramped up our virtual world quite a bit uh, when we got into COVID. And that's helped us a lot, oddly enough. And I think uh, a lot of the situations that were occurring across the U.S., like the, uh, the George Floyd situation, really brought more attention to us. And it caused us to engage on a broader uh, national level. We are a national organization. So we, we engage audiences uh, virtually. Uh, we engage audience with on-site training program. We have diversity, equity, and inclusion training that we offer to, to uh, uh, organizations and individuals around the city. And uh, we also have um, a, a educational programs where we uh, go and work with administrators as well as uh, uh, we have a lot of, uh, uh, before COVID, a lot of uh, elementary K through 12 students who will come in and, and visit the, uh, the Freedom Center. So we have a variety of ways of doing that. We also have uh, created uh, virtual tours so that people can go onto our website and they can go and see a lot of our virtual programs. They can also do a virtual tour of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center by going, by going online. So you're, so you're looking at this as a, as a, a full on modern um, approach to not only connecting uh, physically when people can visit the center, but also to create a dialogue that, that unfolds uh, online uh, and through other educational materials. Absolutely, and, and, and I think it, it speaks to one of the things we pride ourselves on is being what we call a convener of dialogue. Uh, I think we were talking about this earlier where it's important for people to get together and have this discussion sometimes very tough discussions. And what we found, at least I found is that a lot of people where they may not be comfortable having those conversations in their workplaces, when they come into the Freedom Center, it tends to loosen them up and we have ways of and information that we share with them to open their eyes and open their minds. So yes, we basically uh, really try to, uh, try to be that convener of dialogue and try to have uh, engagement with our uh, community and audiences on a, a local national basis. Our audiences basically, or I would say kind of, it's a, it's a pretty diverse audience. It pretty much reflects about the, uh, the demographics of the US in general. We get uh, visitors from, from out of state, but most of our attendees are in a regional, uh, from a regional market, probably within an hour and a half drive of Cincinnati. Uh, predominantly, I would say probably, you know, a little more to the white side uh, uh, in terms of uh, people who come to the museum, but uh, it's a pretty, pretty diverse audience overall. And uh, it's, uh, 
Uh, it's a national, international audience. We have uh, uh, programs and a website that deals with uh, human trafficking, which is, a, which is another form of modern day enslavement that we, uh, we focus on. We have a permanent exhibit on that. And so that is really an audience that basically attracts, uh, uh, that feature attracts a lot of people from the international audience as well. But uh, we're a national brand, uh, really a global brand. And uh, we have a, a pretty diverse audience uh, that we reach uh, both uh, on site and also virtually. You know, one of the things that strikes me, I've read, I've read some of the laws and some of the text of the laws uh, that were passed in Texas, kind of, kind of shocking, uh, outlawing uh, teaching in public schools of some parts of this story. It strikes me that, that um, if you took your programs and you transported them into a public school setting, that these new laws um, are making the, the teaching of these types of facts, the historical facts, um, they might not be the only perspective because there are multiple perspectives in, in history, but the teaching of these facts um, are, are not only frowned upon, but are in some respects illegal, right? In other words, if you teach about, if you, if you make the comparison to um, a plantation, to a concentration camp, and the extraction of, of labor under threat of death, right? If you make that comparison, uh, you are suddenly required to uh, to show some sort of a counterbalancing perspective. Um, uh, I just I just don't get it. Could you both comment, Ashley? Um, let's start with you. Could you comment on this whole idea of what in America we should be teaching as part of our our public education, in other words, our civil society education about America? Because we're not. We're not just one thing. We're not just one people, right? We have different ideas. We have different experiences. Shouldn't different perspectives be part of, of education? And, and how do you feel about this idea of, of legislating that you cannot teach a certain perspective? It's, it's, it's outlawed or it has to, it has to always come with, with something else uh, that, that, um, that basically, um, places all facts in a relative position. I think we should all be very concerned when um, state legislatures start deciding what is okay to talk about in terms of our history and what's not. Um, it's a major, it's a major concern. You know, uh, history is about power um, and it's about the maintenance of power. And what you see um, in you know, the, the conservative think tank that wrote all of that legislation that got passed in several states, it went up in Louisiana too, but it was defeated. Um, you know, if you read it, they don't even really understand what critical race theory is. It's a flashpoint. It's something to scare people who don't understand what the conversation is about. Um, critical race theory, just, well, why don't, why don't you give your definition of, of at the very basis level, critical race theory is the understanding that race has been an important factor in the history of this country. <laughs> and you can't really look at the history of this country and deny that. I mean, it's, it's actually impossible to look at everything that's happened in this country and say race didn't matter. Race mattered and it matters now, right? And as our, our director of research at Whitney Plantation says, hidden history hurts, you know, we're not gonna get past any of this. We are not past it now, right? And we're not gonna get there unless we actually deal with it. I think there's this idea that somehow acknowledging the truth of our history, which is about enslavement and genocide and white supremacy, these are not up for debate, those are facts, right? Those are things that have happened here, right? But somehow den den acknowledging it makes it impossible to be patriotic or to have love of country, or to have love of you know, fellow citizen, right? And we have to get past that because all that's doing is just denying. I mean, if you think about your own personal life, when you deny your problems, what happens, right? They keep bubbling up and coming back and coming back. You can't get over it until you actually unpack it and deal with it. A couple of years ago, I saw John Lewis speak and he described history as a wound and we, we have not healed it. You know, well, you know, we just got a got an interesting point that was made um, by uh, one of our viewers. Said that um, you know, when you're teaching history, it should really be about all of the above. There should be 
uh, the, the essential point was that there should be different uh, perspectives reflected. And there are different truths. Each of those truths coexist, right? It depends on your perspective. It depends on what you experience. Uh, Woody, how do you see the connection between uh, these, these laws, which are trying to create sort of one American history that is generic and that is patriotic and so on, um, as opposed to a uh, multi-dimensional, multi-layered uh, approach that might uh, reveal different pr different truths, and some of these truths might be in opposition to each other. How do you see um, what you're doing as part of this uh, whole unfolding uh, chapter of, of of looking at America uh, through different uh, different eyes? Well, I'm I'm um, with Ashley 100. Uh, percent I'm very very concerned about uh, about some of these laws. We are, as a matter of fact, have a law in, uh, circulating in the uh, Ohio State House right now on this subject issue. Um, the way I see it, Mark, is that when you look back at the the, the legacy of slavery and so forth, we have basically the, the slavery has been perpetuated based upon the legal system. And uh, laws that uh, you know uh, prevented people from being truly free, from prevented people from from voting, uh, the black codes. Even though people were living in free land, there were things known as the black codes that basically denied them rights of things like basic rights, like things to vote and so forth. And my concern is that if if, if, if people are not, I think it's important to have balance and perspectives when when you're learning. But you need to teach the facts and you need to teach all of the facts, I think, and not just one side of the, of the fact. And that's what's happening. I can't tell you how many people come to our organization and when our historians and, and docents continue, uh, finish the tour, as we go through, they, I didn't know that. I wasn't taught that in, 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 in our history, in my history classes. Nowhere did I hear anything about that. Nowhere did I hear anything about what these African-Americans did, et cetera, et cetera. And that comes from... Uh, a lot of that, I think these laws are designed and intentionally designed to to perpetuate the white power structure and mm -hmm. keep people from knowing the truth and therefore keeping people from understanding what, what real freedom is all about. So our intention is basically to continue to tell the truth. We will advocate strategically where we need to advocate to, to ensure that there's balanced perspectives and that people do hear other perspectives and not just one side of, of, of the ledger in terms of... Uh, of what America's history is all about, because this is America's history. And again, it was perpetuated um, based on economics and also highly supported and perpetuated by a, a, a very uh, accommodating legal system that uh, we need to be careful and watch carefully as we move forward. I think it's really important that, that people take counsel of the, of the work that you're both doing in your staffs and your board. The whole idea of just understanding a little bit better and maybe year after year understanding just a little bit better than we understood the last year, uh, understanding and listening to different perspectives. You know, one of the things that that strikes me is that division only exists because people aren't listening to each other. Doesn't right. mean that we'll all agree. There's there, there's no way that that we're going to uh, find common cause with people who want to tear down the United States of America. But building up the United States of America also means telling its true history. I'd like to thank you both for helping us to understand this part of the history, uh, work that will never be done, but work that is advanced by both of your organizations, Ashley Rogers, Executive Director of the Whitney Plantation Museum in Louisiana, and Woody Keogh, uh, President and CEO of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your insights to us. And please thank your staffs and, and your boards for, for their fantastic work. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you. You too.